Good evening, everyone. My name is Sam Nasser, and this is the Azure Cleveland User Group. A little bit about the group. We meet every second Wednesday of the month. The meetings are free of charge and open to the public. And we cover a variety of topics related to Azure, whether it's infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, or the infamous software as a service. You can find meeting information posted at meetup.com at the link listed at the bottom of the slide. We'd like to give a big thank you to our sponsors, PostSharp and DevExpress, for sponsoring the post-meeting prizes, which will be given away using the eval forms. Uh, we'd like to thank the .NET Foundation for sponsoring the Meetup site. And last but not least, NIS Technologies for sponsoring the virtual meeting space. If you're interested, Manning.com is offering a 35% off a selection of books at the link listed at the bottom of the slide with the discount code MTPCLEC21. Some additional information, please keep in mind participation is encouraged. And like I always say, the only stupid question is the one not being asked. So always feel free to jump in with any questions or comments. However, when not speaking, kindly ask you to mute your microphones just to avoid any background noise. And we want to keep it casual but organized, so feel free to jump in with questions. However, uh, we want to give our speaker enough time to go through the presentation and the demos. Lastly, the presentation is being recorded and will be posted on YouTube. So for tonight's feature presentation, it is Azure VM Management and IAS Updates by Sashida Gawid. She specializes in modern management and enterprise mobility. Uh, she leverages Azure and Endpoint Configuration Manager in IAAS. And she manages an Endpoint Engineering team for a very large healthcare organization in Northeast Ohio. She loves learning new technology and knowledge sharing. And so with that, let me turn it over to Sushita. Sushita, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thank you. I look forward to today's presentation and hopefully you learn something from me, you know, all our viewers. Uh, absolutely. Looking forward to it. So yeah, hi everyone, and thank you, Sam, for the um, intro. Um, I am Sucheta Goed. Welcome to my session on Microsoft Azure IS Compute and Management with a focus on Azure Virtual Machines. Um, and I'll also go through the latest innovations in IS. And um, a little bit about myself, uh, although Sam already mentioned some of it. So I'm a manager in healthcare IT with a focus on endpoint engineering. I specialize in modern management, enterprise mobility, leveraging Azure and Microsoft Endpoint Configuration Manager, which is like a combination of um, SCCM on-prem as well as Intune in the cloud. I'm a 12 times Microsoft certified professional. I like learning tech and collaborating for knowledge sharing with tech enthusiasts. Uh, my socials are listed on the slide. Let's look at the agenda here. So I'll start with setting a foundation for our topic today with an overview of IaaS, Azure's physical infrastructure that is foundational to IaaS, um, followed by why we would use IaaS and the benefits it brings. Then expanding on that, we'll delve into IaaS compute, virtual machines, virtual machine scale sets, and so on. Um, I'll continue from there and walk you through explaining the specifics of virtual machines. Um, you know, why are virtual machines important? We'll see VM use cases, and by VM I mean virtual machines. And we'll closely review the architecture of a Windows virtual machine. We'll also look at the various VM types uh, that are available uh, or provided by Microsoft and the third parties. Next, I'll highlight um, some enhanced in IaaS as announced by Microsoft at Ignite a couple months ago. From there, we'll dive into the management, security, monitoring, and cost aspects of virtual machines. And post that, we move into the demo in which we build a virtual machine and look at its various components. And lastly, I'll share some resources and discuss what you can do next with the understanding that you would gain in this session. And of course, feel free to ask questions. So let's see what is IaaS. Now, infrastructure as a service, that is IaaS, is the basic category of Azure's cloud computing service. IaaS offers essential compute, storage, and networking resources on demand on a pay-as-you-go basis. And virtual machines is a classic example of IaaS. 
um, and well, other examples include, you know, virtual machine scale sets, which we'll talk about further. Um, Azure Files is another example of IaaS, or Azure Load Balancer. Um, so IaaS doesn't mean just virtual machines. It comprises of most of the infrastructure entails um, compute, network, and storage resources. And if you look at the figure, you'll notice that IaaS includes servers and storage, networking, and the physical data center. Now, Azure uses a cloud computing model based on categories of the service provided to customers, which include IaaS um, and even PaaS, which is platform as a service, um, and SaaS, which is software as a service, in, and also they have serverless. So uh, Microsoft shares some or all of the responsibility for components in the computing stack in each of these IaaS, PaaS, and SaaS categories. And we look further into the separation of duties between Microsoft and the customer for IaaS in an upcoming slide. Um, however, using the IaaS service, um, Azure becomes the equivalent of your physical data, but in the cloud. And as part of the IS service, instant computing infrastructure is provided by Microsoft to us, and the management is over the internet. So that's pretty much um, IS in a nutshell. Um, I also wanted to show you the Azure physical infrastructure. So like the computing infrastructure um, or physical data centers that Microsoft provides can be visualized in this figure. Um, and let's look at that for a, let's look at that at a, for a bit here, um, just to set the foundation. And this data was shared at Ignite a few months ago um, and has quite the latest information, I would think. So um, Azure operates in numerous regions globally. Um, as you can see on the map, a region represents a geographical area that contains one or more data centers networked together. So a region is essentially a collection of data centers. Um, and you can see that with Azure, we get you know, global scale, um, local presence, the infrastructure spans over 60 regions worldwide with more than 300 data centers as they've listed here. And basically, regions allow to respect data sovereignty needs and provide us with a robust failover model. Um, and while building solutions in Azure, we can choose the region where our infrastructure runs so that it is closest to our um, data and customers. Um, again, access can be over the internet or to optimize the connection to the service, we can establish um, a fast and dedicated connection to Azure by an express route. Um, there's also the concept of region pairs in which two regions within the same geography are paired. Um, this helps reduce interruptions to your workloads running in Azure because because of events such as, you know, say, power outages or natural disasters, for that matter. Um, and Azure also comprises of, you know, all these um, availability zone concepts and availability sets. Um, so I'll touch upon them as well. Availability zones are physically separate locations or data centers within an Azure region with independent power and cooling um, and networking. Um, they can physically separate your resources within an Azure region. And then the availability sets, these automatically distribute your VMs across fault domains. They help keep your application online during maintenance or a hardware failure. So uh, it's important to understand that you know, concept of availability sets, although it's a little older concept, but because it you know, helps you keep your applications up and running. And such capabilities, when implemented, they help with your Azure workloads highly available, um, you know, ensures failover your server is implemented, and drastically reduce downtime in events such as those um, outages or disasters. And we will see some of these configurations in action in the demo as well. So with that, let's move forward. Um, let's look at why we should leverage IS, you know, what advantages does it provide? And, and basically, let's learn why you would start to plan and implement IS solutions in Azure. Now, because IS provides you with the internet computing infrastructure, Azure essentially manages the underlying physical infrastructure for you 
from within the data centers that we just looked at the um, looked on the map. Um, what you need to do is purchase, um, install, configure, and manage your software, including operating systems, middleware, and applications. Um, and of course, you'll be managing your data and identities. Um, and if you look at the figure on the right, it gives a quick bit responsibility. So IaaS lets you bypass the cost and complexity of buying and managing physical servers and data center infrastructure. Each resource is offered as a separate service component in Azure, and you only pay for a particular resource as long as you use it or as long as you need it. Um, and migrating your organization's infrastructure to an IaaS solution helps you reduce maintenance of um, on-premises data centers, um, save money on hardware costs and you also gain real-time business insights and that's very uh, you know very much es essential is solutions also give you the flexibility to scale your IT resources up and down with demand um, they help you quickly provision new applications and increase the reliability of the underlying infrastructure um, with is you can implement infrastructure redundancy as we just saw in an earlier slide um, with region pairs and availability zones, instance, um, and that ensures BCDR scenarios, right? Your business continuity, disaster recovery, uh, those kind of situations. Um, and likewise, with IaaS implementations in Azure, you can build in security for your workloads with um, things like network security groups, confidential virtual machines, and so on. And I'll talk more about these uh, couple things in upcoming slides. So, um, and because IaaS offers essential compute, storage, and networking resources instantly on demand, um, and you can build solutions and environments quickly, it benefits you with performing um, rapid innovation and deployment of your products and services. So it definitely has a bunch of you know, advantages. And if you compare um, among um, IaaS, PaaS, and SaaS, IaaS gives you the most control. Uh, meaning you have the flexibility to design and build environments of your choice, starting right from choosing the OS you want um, to installing the runtimes and apps you desire to develop your products and much more. Uh, IS is the most flexible cloud service. Um, so that's pretty much about you know why IS, but I think it definitely um, entails a lot um, and it gives um, you know a good control to you to do your um, to run your applications and workloads in Azure. So next, we'll look at the relation between IaaS, compute, VMs, and VMSs. And VMSs is um, essentially the virtual machine scale sets. So we know that compute is a part of IaaS, right? Compute consists of services such as virtual machines and virtual machine scale sets. Virtual machines are a foundation of infrastructure as a service. Um, you can create Windows and Linux virtual machines of your choice. Um, and Azure provides the option of virtual machine scale sets to make your apps highly resilient um, and scalable. So scalability is the main aspect of virtual machine scale sets. Um, they let you create, the virtual machine scale sets let you create and manage a group of load virtual machines so it's not just a single virtual machine but more than one and the number of virtual machine instances can automatically increase or decrease uh, like you can set it to automate or you know based on the response um, or the, your demand or a defined schedule so you have control over that um, provides high availability and application resiliency by distributing virtual machines across availability zones um, or fault domains and Azure does that for you automatically. That's pretty much you know, how these things are connected to each other. So moving ahead from there, um, why virtual machines, right? Why learn about virtual machines? Why would you use them and for what purposes? Uh, because this machine apparently, as some uh, people say, is kind of you know, not so, it's kind of a least, um, important service in Azure because we have better things to do. We have the AI service and other things, but uh, VMs is important because virtual machines are integral to a number of services we have in Azure. 
Um, and that is why VMs um, are that important. You know, virtual machines, sets, they use virtual machines. We have our um, Azure, um, Azure Kubernetes um, service, the AKS, which has node pools, and that uses virtual machine scale sets. Um, there are advanced connectivity um, services or you know, uh, solutions like gateways and VPNs, which give access to other networks, um, and they are built off of virtual machine scale sets. So you know, there are a lot of um, solutions within Azure which are built on top of virtual machines. So understanding the capabilities, you know, the SKUs or the sizes of virtual machines, how to interact with it, um, that is all going to apply to these um, high level things that sit on top. And that's why I think it's important to know the, you know, the virtual machines uh, as an integral part of Azure. Uh, virtual machines provide the flexibility of virtualization for a wide range of computing solutions. Um, they are designed for all budgets and workloads, uh, starting from like the economical series, which is mostly the B-series virtual machines, to the high-end GPU virtual machines, which are mainly optimized for machine learning or even you know, graphics and video rendering. Um, and we can build and manage virtual machines from custom images or even from command line scripts. Um, there are robust offerings in terms of uh, build, manage, management, monitoring, and we'll learn more on that as we move along here. Um, you can rapidly create and dismantle dev and test environments with virtual machines, speeding up the introduction of new applications and you know, efficiently scaling resources um, as needed. Um, Azure virtual machines can host web servers, applications, you can use virtual machines for all sorts of use cases, um, such as running customer facing websites or enterprise applications like SQL or any other kind of Windows server or Linux based operating systems and applications. You can use virtual machines to deploy existing applications from on premises or develop and deploy new applications. Azure virtual machines can be used to extend the organization's on-prem data center capacity into the cloud without significant upfront investment or physical hardware, right? Because IS provides us the hardware. The VMs can host virtual desktops or entire virtualized environments, providing remote access to applications and resources. So that's why we should learn about virtual machines. So now um, let's dive deeper into virtual machines and their management. So if you have workloads that require you to have control of the underlying operating system, um, so you can manage the configuration of say servers and application installation, then Azure Virtual Machines is what's needed. You can deploy your server infrastructure to Azure Virtual Machines, uh, provision on-demand, high-scale, secure, virtualized infrastructure using Windows Server. You can run your work in the cloud and reduce the redundancy and maintenance of physical hardware. And when we say virtual machine, it's actually a virtual version of CPU, RAM, disk, network interface. Um, and you can create your own Windows or Linux virtual machines instantly within a subscription in a few clicks. You run through the various configuration options available to build the VM um, that of your choice. And there's a plethora of variations available to build your exact VM of choice. Um, Azure has a VM size for almost every workload that you could imagine, I must say. And there are different ways in which you can create your virtual machine. You can do it manually in the portal or use automated methods. When you establish virtual machines for your workloads in the cloud, um, it is always best practice to implement more than one virtual machine and configure infrastructure redundancy options, such as virtual machine scale sets, you know, availability zone, availability set, depending on the type of your workload. Um, you have full access to everything inside the VM. You are also responsible for everything inside the VM, like the guest operating system, runtimes, applications, 
we just don't have to worry about the physical hardware. But then packaging, backup, antivirus, any configuration, all of that is uh, the customer's or your responsibility for within the VM. Um, so essentially, you're responsible for the overall management, troubleshooting and monitoring of your VMs, and Azure provides various tools to support that. So that's the best part, right? You have all the tools you need at your fingertips to be able to better manage uh, your VMs. Well, that's coming up. Now moving on, the figure on this slide, it shows the reference architecture of Windows Virtual Machine in Azure. When we create virtual machines, it's not just the VM. We also have other components that go around it. Um, Azure offers a large catalog of predefined and third-party reference virtual images in the marketplace. You could start with creating the VM from you know, one of those marketplace images like Windows or Linux virtual machine, um, or upload your own custom image where you've maybe tweaks that make sense for your organization. But then with the VM creation, we have the managed disk that you see in the figure so that we can have storage. You're going to have an operating system disk that comes with the VM, but you might want to add data disks to store your application data. And these disks are that you separately attach to your VM are not a part of the VM inherently. They are mainly part of, uh, they are mainly external to the virtual machine. Um, then we are going to have networking, you know, virtual network. We add our different subnets for what makes sense for our infrastructure. We are going to have a network interface card, uh, a NIC on that virtual machine, so we can communicate to other services within Azure. And then we have our network security group the NSG, which is essential for security, it lets us you know, allow or deny traffic to the VM. You can also have monitoring. For example, you, know, you want to monitor uh, maybe boot diagnostics. Um, you might obtain diagnostic logs, which are saved to a storage account. So you also need a storage account along with that. Your VM is going to have a public IP address. Um, all these different create will be put in a resource group. So that's the um, outlining resource group that you see in the figure, which mostly encompasses all of these resources. Um, the resource group is a way of logically encapsulating all of these different resources. Um, it is best practice to add all such resources, type the VM um, as an example here, in the same resource group. So they remain in the same on the same life cycle. Um, for instance, if I delete this VM, we create, we want to delete its corresponding storage, the IP address, um, you know, everything that entails the VM. Uh, and it would make sense in that case to just delete the overarching resource group and be done. Um, if the VM and all things around it that were built were added to the same re resource group, that is. Um, I mean, there, there are instances where you may not add all of your resources in the same resource group when you create a VM, but it depends on your environment, the way you uh, manage things, and you know the, the organization that you need to do with your resources in Azure. So yeah, that's pretty much um, about the architecture of an actual virtual machine. So there's definitely more to it than just the VM itself. So um, let's now look at what different types of VMs can be built. And this is important. Now, you may have different types of workloads, you know, ones requiring high memory or storage capacity, um, or you may want to deploy something that needs a high performance VM or run a workload in which um, you need higher security or maybe optimize compute and so on. And Azure offers a range of VM series and sizes differing in the power and performance they offer. Um, now, in dev test, we may only need the entry level A series for our application. Um, also, for like web server, databases, code repos, we can do with the entry level A series. Um, they are a great low cost option. Uh, 
Then we have the D series, which is for general purpose compute. You know, most app server or relational database workloads are best run on the D series. It means uh, it meets um, requirements of most production workloads. For higher performance, when in production, we may switch to a D series VM. Um, you know, as against using the A series based on def environment. Um, then for higher security, you would want to use a DC series, which is a confidential VM. The C stands for confidential. It has the technology to encrypt data while in use. Um, a good example would be healthcare, you know, where you want to encrypt data. Next is the E series, which is memory optimized VMs um, used mostly for like relational databases or, you know, data analytics. That a good example. Um, next up, F series. These are compute optimized, um, and I think they would be used, you know, for like batch processing or gaming applications, where you really need uh, compute optimized um, machines. The B series VMs are burstable VMs. Um, these are best suited for workloads that run uh, at a low to moderate CPU baseline. Um, so like you you can work on the VM with just minimal CPU, but then sometimes you need a burst of a higher CPU utilization for your app. Um, maybe say like when the demand rises, you know, like a hotel check check in check out application. So in the in those cases, V series burstable VM would be a good option, and that's also a kind of economical. You can maybe save some cost um, with using that kind of a machine. Then we have the N series, and uh, these are the GPU uh, optimized VMs. Um, these come with extreme computing power for high performance, um, for computing, and remote virtualization workloads. So obviously, you know, for graphics and video, uh, even for machine learning, they are definitely helpful. We have the H series VMs, which are optimized for high performance computing applications such as, you know, weather simulation and computational chemistry. That's really high level. Um, the L series is storage optimized. If you need to run big data, um, no SQL data, or, you know, large data warehousing solutions in Azure, then you could use these as they provide high throughput. Um, these VMs also provide a large amount of local storage. So that's helpful. So yeah, there are several options, you know, from for for basic from basic to advanced workloads, um, and there are additional SKUs that are available, various sizes that are available, and by SKUs I mean, you know, the letters that you see in here, the A, L, N, those are basically identifying the SKUs, and then the sizes will be mostly in numbers where you know you have so much CPU, um, you have so much um, memory available. Um, that's the measure for the size. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much for the various um, machine types that are available. Um, obviously, there are more, and we'll see some of that as we do the demo. So yeah, let's take a quick look at the updates announced at Ignite a couple months ago as far as IaaS goes. This is not comprehensive. This is not all of it, but I wanted to bring up at least the most important ones. So as Microsoft focuses on continuous innovation in the infrastructure phase, uh, space, one of the innovations that was announced was the Azure Cobalt 100. And this chip delivers the fastest ARM CPU performance in the cloud. Um, they also announced the general availability of Azure Boost. Uh, Boost is basically a system designed to offload server virtualization processes to um, like they have purpose-built hardware and software. And um, per Microsoft, every new Azure Virtual Machine uh, that we now create apparently integrates with the Azure Boost technology. And that makes, um, you know, Azure networking and storage solutions fastest in the world. Azure Boost contains features that improve the performance Authority of your virtual machines, so I think it's um, it's it's really good to have that ingrained into um, you know newer virtual machines that you build in Azure. 
Um, then you can see in the figure at the bottom where um, announcements were made around some new and updated virtual machine types. And like I said, these are, these are just some highlights from the overall announcements. Um, apart from these, you know, Microsoft also announced Azure Storage Mover or with which you could migrate on-premises SMB uh, shares to Azure files effectively. Um, so yeah, there are many new things trickling in that we need to keep up with. So we, I think we should just keep reading about things and be abreast with stuff. So with that, um, let's get into some management, security, and monitoring aspects of VMs. Um, one of the basic things you would do as part of management and security for your virtual machines is patching them regularly for monthly updates. Um, patch inside the guest OS by leveraging things such as Azure Auto Manage, Azure Update Manager. Um, backup and patching can be handled by Azure Auto Manage um, automatically. Uh, we can configure that. Azure Update Manager is a service that helps uh, manage updates for your VMs. So that, that comes in very handy. Um, you'd also want to keep your other software that's installed on the VM up to date on latest versions. Um, we have Azure Monitor. Um, you can create dashboards um, to only show you know, what we want to monitor. We can monitor the health and availability of IS services and apps through the Azure portal. We can use Azure Log Analytics um, and Azure Application Insights. These will be used to explore Azure Log data and application performance data. We can set up alerts around you know, specific SLAs that we would want to track. Um, we can configure boot diagnostics. Um, I think I touched upon that earlier. So while building a VM, we can add things like monitoring from boot diagnostics to kind of troubleshoot boot failures, um, and then we can review logs. Um, for granular access, RBAC comes into play. Uh, RBAC is role-based access control. It allows to set different job roles into resource groups. Uh, mostly it gives you granular control over you know, who can do something and who cannot. Um, we can use these to define the level of access users uh, must have. Um, for your different definition when administering Azure. And when building your VM, um, you can choose the security type. There are capabilities available for trusted launch and confidential virtual machines with secure boot and virtual TPM chips. Um, they add security to the VM. Um, for even higher security, we use the DC series. Uh, we saw that on the earlier slide which is the confidential VMs that it has encryption technology. Um, you use network security groups, NSGs to implement security. And a little bit about NSGs, let, let me touch upon that. So NSGs allow you to define firewall policies. So we can build rules to allow or deny traffic. Um, say you need to limit the type of connections from the web servers to the database server. You can use an NSG to achieve that type of um, uh, restriction. You can control ports, inbound and outbound connectivity with security um, group roles uh, within the NSG. You can also configure just-in-time VM access. That's the JIT. Um, that, that typically uses Microsoft Defender for Cloud's um, JIT technology. Um, you know, it, it protects VMs from unauthorized network access. Um, it lets you allow access to your VMs only when the access is needed um, on specific ports that uh, you define and for the period of time that you define. So that gives a more control uh, over, you know, VM access. Yeah, and in terms of overall security, um, we should enable Azure Security Center, you know. Um, provides a view of the security state of uh, all of our resources. We can verify the security controls that are in place and whether they are configured correctly. Um, and we can identify resources that require attention. For instance, production VMs that 
are not using encryption. You know, you might want to go find them. Um, Azure Security Center will tell you that. And then you can take action based on the recommendations. We can also set up alerts um, and we can receive recommendations, like I said. Um, you can also leverage Azure Advisor um, as it provides security recommendations, among other things. So that's mostly making your uh, VM environment secure. Um, I have this one slide uh, before we get into the demo. So um, once I'm done with this, I'll stop for questions. Let's quickly finish up on the cost optimization. So how do you optimize cost? And how do you spend less when working with virtual machines, right? Um, well, the simplest thing to do is save money on your virtual machines by turning them off when not in use. But of course, only when that's feasible, right? You don't want to, you may not be able to do that in phys, uh, production environments, but dev environments, test environments, you can definitely put a schedule together to shut your machines down. Um, when VMs are being used, you are paying for the compute resources because it's cloud computing, right? So um, along with that, um, you're also paying for things like storage and so on. Um, however, if you stop the VM when it's not in use, you save on the compute cost that you would incur um, while still paying for the allocated storage, um, if not any additional storage. If you shut down from Windows, um, like if you shut your VM from the Windows um, when you are inside the VM, then it is only shut on the guest. Like uh, it, it won't be fully shut on the Azure fabric. So it continues to be provisioned in Azure in that case. So there's a particular way in which you would want to rightly stop or shut down your virtual machine. And we'll cover that in the demo as well. Um, so if you shut it from Windows, uh, you would still be built for it. You know, um, So you want to stop it in the Azure portal itself. Um, and you want to see the words stopped deallocated uh, which actually means that it is stopped and Azure is not going to charge you for the compute at that point. Um, so yeah, as far as building virtual machines so that you don't waste resources and you don't overpay on virtual machines, you must find the right fit of virtual machines, queues and sizes for your workload. You can leverage your hybrid benefit, which is a cost-effective choice for your Windows Server or SQL Server cloud migration. You can use your existing on-premises licenses with uh, software assurance if that's active, and you can save on licensing costs in that way. And then we have Azure Reserved Virtual Machine Instances. Um, these provide a considerable price savings compared to pay-as-you-go pay pricing. You can significantly reduce costs with one year or you know three year terms for Windows and Linux VMs. You can forecast your resource needs. Um, that's basically you know declaring VMs for use throughout a period of time, and you pay for them in advance. Then there's also the Azure Savings Plan. It's slightly different. Um, in this, you save money by committing to spending a fixed hourly amount for one or three years and you unlock lower price um, until you reach the hourly commitment. Uh, next is Azure Spot Discount. Uh, this allows us to use unused capacity as it becomes available at a significantly low price. However, there's a caveat in here. So at any point in time when Azure needs the capacity back, these spot VMs are evicted. Um, and we are required to return the capacity back to Azure um, with a very short notice. So that's why spot VMs are great, you know, uh, cost-wise, but then uh, maybe you should use them only for workloads that can handle interruptions, uh, you know, batch processing jobs, or um, they would be best for test environments um, if that's feasible. Um, so if I'm stopped, my work would resume at the point I had stopped. So that's kind of how it works with um, Azure Spot VMs. Uh, it is definitely an attractive option for resumable workload um, and for something that's not time critical. Azure 
advisor, which is applicable to things outside of VMs as well, uh, not limited to virtual machines. Helps your uh, deployed resources and recommends ways to improve availability, security, performance, along with cost. Um, it is like a personalized cloud consultant. Uh, it gives best practice recommendations to improve your environment. And then we have, lastly, the pricing calculator, which um, again applies to overall things that we do in Azure. Um, it is used to calculate or estimated hourly or monthly costs for using things in Azure. Um, you could add your planned VMs to the estimate. Um, and outside of that, you know, you definitely want to keep an eye on cost management and billing in Azure. Um, do your budgeting, forecasting properly for virtual machines and so on. So all that should eventually help with um, increasing ROI and optimizing costs. And with that, uh, that brings us to the demo. So let's see things in action. And I'm going to do that on my other screen. Probably going to stop sharing real quick here. Okay. So we get into the demo and what we'll do is we build a virtual machine. I'm gonna share my screen in a minute here. <coughs> All right, so and before I start the demo, uh, do we have any questions that we would like to take at this point? Yeah, I had a question for you, Sushita. Um, with regards mm -hmm. to the confidential virtual machines, so is the is the disk only encrypted or is the traffic encrypted uh, as you're accessing that VM? I think there are different types. Um, so as far as the confidential VM goes, it's mainly the disk that is in encrypted but then if you want more encryption um, we'll see some more in the demo right now but um, there are ways different ways that you can you know build in more uh, security um, if you want to encrypt traffic there's probably different ways to do it so okay. we'll, we'll, I'll uh, show you some options here as we build one mm -hmm. also in addition can an existing VM be, be configured to be confidential uh, after it's been in use or is this only done from the onset at the very beginning? So in most cases, you should be able to, you know, if you already have a VM that's built as a particular SKU, you can stop the VM, reconfigure it, and then start it back, and it works. Um, I would assume that that should work even for the D series or the, the DC series, which is confidential, because it's mainly, you know, the technology that it's using for encryption, even if it's at the hypervisor level, it will probably put you on a different host. So, I yeah, uh, I would think so. Yeah, just because it, it allows you to, you know, be flexible with changing the sizes um, and the uh, series of your VMs. Right. I think the only, um, the only time when it wouldn't allow you is when you actually want to change the generation of the hypervisor that your virtual machine is running on. So like when we create a virtual machine, we select a particular Gen 1 or Gen 2 virtual machine. If you are, if you had selected Gen 1 and then you at some point in time later, you want to change to a generation 2 VM, you might not be able to do that because it's inherently in the physical um, you know, aspect of the hypervisor. So it, that may not be possible. Um, so, I, yeah, that's only the only use case I would think where, like, changing a machine size or skew won't be possible. I see. Okay, thank you. Yep, sure. All right, so let's look at a demo here. And so, while building a virtual machine, there are various um, ways you can do it. Like, you can start in various places. You can start right from here where you create a resource, or you can go here to virtual machines. Um, if I just start here, say create resource, you can even start from here to uh, create a virtual machine, or you can go in compute, look up, you know, there for all the compute resources. Um, so let's do this. Let's start right here. And if you look here, um, this ribbon, it has a bunch of configuration items, and it's going to walk you through all of these different configurations that you'd want to do to eventually build a VM of your choice. 
So um, typically, now mine is a test environment. So obviously, I, I'm not going to have a lot of resource groups already in place or you know other virtual machines that we can um, compare against. But typically, uh, you would have resource groups um, in your existing tenant or subscription. So you might want to determine in advance before you even start to create a virtual machine for what resource group is the virtual machine going to belong to, or are you just going to create a new one? Again, it depends on your workload, you know, whether you have existing workloads in Azure or whether you're just, you know, starting from scratch. Um, also, you would want to be decided or determined on the region that you're going to choose. Um, again, the, choosing the region depends on you know, where you are located at or where your application or where your users are located just to have that, you know, low latency or higher performance. So um, let's start here. So I'm going to start with the basic tab where you first choose the subscription. Um, obviously, in a single tenant, you'll probably have more than one subscriptions. You don't want to accidentally create your uh, VM in a different subscription, which belongs to a different department in your company, maybe. So you choose the subscription and then you choose your resource group. Um, here, I don't have an existing, I have an existing one. I want to use that. Um, what I'm going to do is create a new one um, and let Azure do it for me. So I'm just going to say, RG demo one. And RG is kind of a good you know, syntax that you might want to follow uh, when you create resources in Azure so that you, know, you have good organization around things. So RG demo one is the resource group that we create. Um, I'm going to give the virtual machine a name. Again, I'm going to say VM demo one. Typical names, right? When you are doing a demo. <laughs> um, and then the region, like I said, um, you can choose from all these different regions, but East US makes the most sense to all of us being in Cleveland. So that's what I'm going to choose. Um, availability options. I kind of touched upon this during the presentation. So if you look here, this option basically is um, allowing you to build in redundancy for your infrastructure. So you have three options here, and obviously the fourth one where you don't want any redundancy, but then the availability zone, virtual machine scale set, and availability set. Um, so availability zone, like I said, it is going to, if you, if you, Put your VMs in different zones. Um, like you're creating one VM right now, but in production environments, you might want to create redundant VMs for one use case and put them in different zones so that if there's a data center failure, you're still saved because what this does is it puts the two of your VMs in two different data centers. So if there's a data center failure in one zone, your application will still be up and running on the VM. Um, in the other zone or in the other data center. So that's where this helps. Virtual machine scale sets is mostly for, you know, having multiple VMs, which Azure automatically puts in different um, availability zones and availability sets for you. And this mainly comes in handy for scaling. Um, say like you have an e-commerce website and you're setting up virtual machines to, you know, to serve that uh, website traffic. Um, and at one point in time, you know, maybe during the holidays when, when there's a lot of shopping going around on your website, um, you want to increase the demand um, of your VMs, then this will come in handy to automatically scale up. And by scale up, I mean it adds more instances of the exact same VM. Um, you can also scale down, and you can set automated, automated rules to do that. Um, it will also automatically scale down when your demand or, or your load or the traffic reduces. So after the holiday season, your VMs will reduce in number automatically. So that's where this comes into play. And then availability sets is basically, um, again, I touched upon this, but to elaborate on it a little bit, um, availability sets mainly will help you with you know, failures within a single data center. Say um, now in a data center, there's going to be racks and servers. So availability set will, save your uh, workload uh, because it's going to create multiple VMs and put them in different racks or different servers. Um, and that's how your application will run. So even if one rack goes down in a specific data center, your application will still run because you have set availability sets. So because this is demo, I'm just going to say no redundancy required. 
Moving on, security type. Um, yeah, this is where I think, uh, Sam, this may answer some of your questions. So um, we have a standard option where, you know, the basic level of security um, is provided to your virtual machine because obviously um, Azure has built-in security. So it helps um, to just do a standard machine if you don't really want to do advanced security, or want to take advanced security measures. But then there's a trusted launch virtual machine option. So this one is going to protect against, you know, advanced attacks. And like I said, this will create a gen, uh, generation two virtual machine for you, which is uh, which has features like uh, the trusted platform module. It has UEFI. Um, so that's advanced security uh, inbuilt right into these type of generation two VMs. And then confidential virtual machines. So these offer higher confidentiality and integrity um, guaranteed with you know the trusted execution environment. And that's mainly um, the, the execution environment that is encrypted. So I think these are kind of the options that you have, you know, right at the start when you start to build a VM. Uh, and on top of that, you can add other things. And again, Azure has multiple tools. We have, you know, extensions, which are, um, you know, um, like you can have scripts um, to uh, build in more um, capabilities into your workloads or VMs. Um, and then there are uh, various um, the, the security recommendations that um, Azure Security Center provides. You can use that to you know, put more security into your um, stuff. And obviously, you can do infrastructure as service, which you know you can build in um, security um, through your code and then implement that. Um, and I think um, mainly that um, encrypting traffic will be more related to network. Um, and there are different ways you can, you know, build in security within the virtual networks. So you probably want to uh, leverage those areas as well um, if you want um, highly secure uh, VMs, not just for data, uh, not just for data at rest, but also data in transit. Um, okay, so here I'm going to say standard, and this is the main part where you're going to choose your image. Now it says. Um, it, it gives me an option. And this is not because I did something in this tenant or uh, subscription already. This is just a regular, maybe a featured option or a most a popular option. And if you um, open this up, it's going to give you a bunch of more. And these are just, you know, the most popular ones that it shows um, here, right here. And my recently used was actually this. So these are just, you know, suggested options by Microsoft. And then you can see more images. And I'm going to click on that for a minute here. So the marketplace is where you would find several images. Um, and you can actually choose the one you want. You can search for them. Um, there are obviously various Linux um, virtual machine types, um, Windows virtual machine types. And there's really a plethora of options in here that you can choose from. Um, these are not just Microsoft native, but these are also uh, there are also third party um, offerings in here. So yeah, there's a lot to choose from. Um, there are actually different categories. So if you want a specific category, you can look accordingly, but look at the number of uh, options available. It's a lot. Um, you can also use your own images like I touched upon in the presentation. So your images will sit here. You can pick it from here. Um, there may be community images that are, it's already listed here. So you can pick one of these, but again, Microsoft doesn't guarantee these because these are you know, coming from the community. So yeah, there's various options that you can um, choose from. Um, I'm gonna go with this data center, Windows Server 2022. Yeah, always give it a minute because it keeps to, it tries to refresh um, on you. So, um, it also gives you certain suggestions here that you might want to keep an eye on. You know, it's telling me that the image is compatible with additional security features. So if I click on this, it may give, give me more options that I can build in more security into the VM. Um, by default for this image that I chose, it is showing me that it's not available in ARM. It's only available in x64. Um, yeah, that's what it says here. So I'll go with that. Uh, this is the Azure Spot discount that I um, I touched upon in the presentation. This is where you know you get uh, the machine at a discounted rate, but then 
you may have to return the machine to Azure if Azure needs the capacity. But again, click that if you have, if you're just doing a test or you know anything that's not critical, um, but that will reduce your price if you use that. Um, and then this is the size. So after the image, I think the second most important thing to choose here is the size, because this is where you actually choose your specifications. So again, um, the, there are recommended options in here. And then this is the one that I uh, recently tried. Um, it also shows you the price, tells you how much it's going to cost per month. Um, and again, if you look here, see all sizes, this will show things that I touched upon, you know, the D series, B series, which are the burstable. Um, let's look at the D series, um, B, E, all the different types that are available. So you can pick. Um, I'm probably just going to go with this simple one. And again, D series um, without the C, uh, just the D is the you know general purpose. So typical workloads, you know, um, typical database workloads also uh, are well supported on this. Um, enable hibernation. This is um, this is not in uh, general availability yet, but this I think kind of puts your machine into hibernation mode. Um, but it doesn't rip off your configs or you know it, it allows it allows to keep your um, root volume see it allows to resume from where you started so i think that helps um, this is a good option to have if you need it um, obviously you need to create a username and password for your um, vm because um, this is like a local admin local account that you might want to log in with to start uh, so I'm going to say Azure user one, just give up. Password. Um, okay, so going from there, this is basically where you can set um, RDP port, for instance. Um, again, if this is a production environment, I wouldn't do it. Um, I would probably have a subnet, you know, and then um, or like a, a device or a, a gateway or a, like a, a router or something that's actually going to talk uh, to those public IPs, but I'm not going to give out my public IP of the VM. So um, this part um, is basically where if you want to log into the VM, um, uh, you know, RDP to it, you would configure it and allow the selected ports. There are different options here. I'm going to say none on that. And of course, you can configure this um, um, later as well. So there are different ways you can do things in. All right, encryption at host. Um, so this is mostly for disks and storage, right? Um, like, like it says here, your VMs come with one operating system disk, and it also comes with a temporary disk. Um, and that's the temporary disk is for short-term storage meaning there's no guarantee that the data will persist um, say after an update to the machine or um, not sure about reboots but i think this it, it's temporarily for like cache uh, data or things like that so you don't want to rely on that um, but you want to actually create a, a another disk a managed disk for your app data if that's needed like it says here you can attach additional data disks um, so that's that. So encryption at host, this one basically, you know, encrypts your temporary disks um, and ephemeral OS disks. But again, because we are really not going to store sensitive data in there, we may not want that. But then maybe use cases when you need it. So um, that's where this is going to help. Um, I'm not going to click that. Anyway, I don't have the option available here. So um, OS disk size. Now this one. Um, is important. You want to choose how big your disk um, should be. So I'm going to go with the image default, which is the least. Um, the OS disk type, um, that's that actually gives you a good amount of options. So like you have your regular hard disk drive, but then you also have the premium SSD. Um, obviously, if you choose these, it's going to cost higher. Um, if you just go with the standard uh, HDD, it's going to be not as much costly. So I'm just going to go with that. Um, 
delete with VM. So what it means is, do you really want to delete that when your VM is deleted? And I'm going to say yes to that. Again, this helps from an organization or management standpoint. So let's do that. And then key management. Now, now this option is because if you are going to encrypt your disks, you need to store your encryption keys somewhere. So you either have the option of Azure doing it for you, which is the platform managed key, or you can do your own. Like if you want to maybe store your keys in the Azure key vault, um, that's where customer managed key comes into picture. Um, I'm going to go with platform managed. I'll let Azure do it for me. Um, this is Ultradisk, which um, you know typically used for like SAP HANA applications and things like that, where it really has high IOPS. Um, but obviously, in our case, we may not need that. Again, it's going to cost more. So uh, use it only when it's necessary. And then this is the option where you can actually add more disks, uh, more storage to your virtual machine. And then there are advanced options down here um, saying use managed disks. You always want to use managed disks if you have sensitive data, if you have you know important things running, you know if you have your app data that you uh, don't want to lose uh, because you don't want to store it on a temporary uh, disk on the machine. Um, but again, if you have you know IAC stuff in place where you can just run code and be done again and go back to the same um, um, structure or foundation of your uh, things in virtual machine, then you may be fine. You know by just not selecting managed disk, but managed disk is a better option if you want, you know, if you want, um, if you don't want to worry about losing data. And that's the ephemeral, which is more like temporary storage. So then next is networking. Here, um, now if you see, I did, did not really type in anything. It created um, a virtual network for me, like the VNet. Um, along with a subnet and some IP address ranges. Um, and it's also going to create an IP, a public IP for my VM. Um, this, although um, Azure created it for you, you know, with default names, you can obviously go and change the names anytime you want. Uh, but typically in production scenarios, even before you start to create a virtual machine, you would first create your resource group, you would first create your virtual network because you'll probably have a plan in mind that you want to implement, right? So you'll have your network set up first. You'll have your subnet set up first. You'll have the um, NSG set up on your subnets maybe for network traffic security. Um, you'll probably have your storage accounts created in advance and then you start to create your virtual machine. So that's kind of how it would work in a production scenario, but here we are just in test. So I let Azure do it for me. Um, this is the NIC, the network security group, um, which obviously you can put in, you know, security and allow disallow traffic, close ports, open ports. Um, not going to do that here. And then it gives me the warning: all ports on this virtual machine may be exposed, and that's fine. We are in test. Um, and then you want this um, again? Depends on you know how you do things in your organization, but. Delete the public IP and the NIC when your VM is deleted. Um, to me, I think it's helpful because then you can just be done with deleting just a few things rather than having to look look up um, each each and every item that you created and then you know go and delete one by one. Um, enable accelerated networking. Now this one, if um, again this option may or may not be available depending on your you know the type of VM that you're creating. But if it is an option to you, um, it's better to take advantage of it because this one is basically uh, going to enable low latency, uh, maybe high throughput for uh, on the network interface. So it's kind of inbuilt uh, capability, but it's it's helpful. So if it's available as an option, I would say go for it. And then there's uh, load balancing options available. Um, you would need load balancers if you have you know more than one VMs or um, anything that you need here for like uh, Azure load balancer or Azure uh, application gateway that you want to implement as part of your um, virtual infrastructure. Then we move on to management. 
Um, here in management, now, like I mentioned, uh, Defender for the cloud, um, it does provide certain capabilities here. Um, and basically identity, so like, you can actually have a system assigned managed identity for your virtual machine. And basically what it helps with is it gives um, an identity like credentials for your virtual machine, which the applications inside your virtual machine can use to talk to things outside of your VM, um, talk to other network resources. So that, that helps from that standpoint. Um, it, it's an identity that enables um, resources to authenticate. So um, I'm not going to uh, create that at this point because I don't need it. Um, Azure AD, um, you have, obviously we need the option to log in to our VM with our Azure AD or they should really rename this to Entra ID. Entra ID credentials, so you might wanna check that. In most cases you would, I think, in production. Um, and then, Auto shutdown, this is where you would enable auto shutdown for your VMs. You know, if you're building a dev VM, test VM, uh, demo VM, then you might want to auto shut down. So um, that's basically, if you click it, then it's going to give you more options. You know, what time do you want to shut down and how frequent and, you know, do you want an email to be sent to you and things like that. So just some simple options, but helpful uh, from a management and organization standpoint. Um, backup, you can enable backup for the entire VM. So your VM can be backed up regularly. Um, again, if you check that, we're going to give you more options. I'm not going to do that at this point. Um, guest OS updates, okay. So your VM has an OS which needs patches and updates. Um, if you want to enable hot patch, that actually helps with patching um, critical or security vulnerabilities for your VM without having to reboot it. So that's definitely helpful. So if you read here, it allows you to take critical security updates uh, without restarting. So that's where that comes into a play. And then there are patch orchestration options. So Azure can do the patching for you on your VMs. Um, and Azure can orchestrate that across your various VMs um, in a particular workload if you have more than one VM for redundancy, um, Azure is going to orchestrate updates so that not all the VMs are updated at the same time because that would be terrible. Um, so you have that option to um, have Azure orchestrated or you can do you know, Windows automatic updates like you would do on your personal device. This may not be a recommended option for your production VM workloads because what if the patch is a bad patch? And we've seen that multiple times, you know, I'm in endpoint management, I know how bad that gets. Um, and then it's it's very difficult to uh, roll back uh, bad patches. Um, so it's, it's always good to test patching first, you know, see if that holds up and then put down your production environment. So you may not want to go for that in production. Um, and manual is also not a great option because obviously you don't want to do manually for all your production VMs. Um, so Azure Orchestrated is a good example, um, is put away, I would say, but there are other solutions also, like we talked about um, in the in the slides, where you can use um, Azure Auto Manage or Azure Update Manager. Um, those things can help automate patching for you on your VMs. All right, so that's that. Uh, I'm going to move ahead from here. Monitoring is where you will monitor your VMs. You will monitor the health of your VMs. Yeah, right here. Um, you will um, maybe put in some alerts in place um, just in case, say, uh, a VM, if you want a, an alert when a VM uh, memory level or CPU level goes um, you know, above a threshold, you want to be alerted. You can put those kind of alerts in here. So that's what that helps with. Um, Diagnostics, um, like I mentioned, boot diagnostics, this helps you with you know, identifying or um, you know, logging issues related to booting up of your VMs. Um, again, there are different options how you wanna do that, um, whether with a managed storage account, custom storage account, I wanna disable that here. Um, and then enable OS guest diagnostics. So this is mainly for your OS um, diagnostics for your actual VM uh, inside the VM. Um, so it can also diagnose those kind of things. 
So it says every minute of your virtual machine. So you can you have really good options here for monitoring. And then this is uh, mainly enabling health, uh, application health of um, uh, the applications um, that you use in your VM. So yeah, I think um, these options really help with monitoring, uh, but uh, the only downside to this maybe is, you know, you want to ensure that you have the right storage available. Um, and then you're going to get a, you know, you'll have to pay for the storage, right? Because if this, if these things are going to create logs, um, it typically sends the logs to log analytics or uh, things like that, where you definitely have to pay for, you know, the log storage. Um, so that's kind of something to consider. Moving to advanced, um, here we have extensions. I think I kind of touched upon that. So extensions are something, uh, they basically, you know, like plugins. They provide post deployment configuration and automation. And if we click on this, we can see a whole bunch of extensions that are available. So for instance, I think I mentioned auto manage. This is an extension that you can use um, to, you know, manage, um, to automate some of the stuffs with your, uh, some of the things with your VM. So you can use this extension. So there are different uh, extensions uh, that you might want to explore that may be helpful for your use cases. It's also key vault for Windows. So different things that you can use. Um, if you ever find the need for anything that you need in addition to what's available, you can go and look up extensions and there are third party solutions as well that are available. So that helps. Um, VM applications, this is where you want applications or software on your VM. Um, and this is the area where you can select an application to install. <clears throat> Again, this gives you a good list of different applications. Oh, I don't have one. So um, you might have you might have in your production environment, you know, some applications already defined and configured. So you can pick from there and then as you build your machine, it's going to install, uh, once you build your, once the provisioning is done, it's going to install those apps for you. But if not here, there obviously are other ways to do it. Um, and then there is custom data. So like if you want to pass a script or a configuration file and you want it to be available right after your VM is provisioned, like even before someone can log into it, you know, there may be configurations where um, you want a particular startup application to launch and then you want a particular configuration inside of it. So that's kind of a scenario where you would want to pass a configuration file when you are actually building your VM. And then there's user data. Obviously it says user data, but it's not actual user data. It's mostly data that your application will use, you know, um, quite similar to what we saw in the configuration files, but um, if there's anything that you need to uh, for the application inside of the VM, then this is where uh, uh, you would configure that. And this will be available throughout the lifetime of the virtual machine. And obviously it has to be because um, you're, you're passing it because your applications are going to need it. So various options here as you build your VMs. Um, there's NVMe disks available. Um, again, these are high-end storage disks, um, you know, high IOPS, high throughput, you would want to use them only for, you know, uh, high performance workloads. So um, obviously going to cost you. Um, so that's that. And then um, host. So Azure dedicated host. This is where if you have this whole, th these two options here, um, actually, no, just this one. This option here is basically for when you want, um, to keep your virtual machines isolated from the Azure public, um, you know, or other customers that are using virtual machines. Because if you're building a virtual machine, if another customer is building a virtual machine, there are you know, high chances that the two virtual machines will be on the same host, uh, the same Hyper-V. But you might not like that, you know, maybe if you are in a, you know, restrictive environment, um, you know, industry like healthcare, again, healthcare is a great example always. Um, if you want to keep your virtual machines only in a particular host where you don't want to share the host with another customer, then dedicated hosts is what you can configure. 
um, and there are a couple different options here. So, so this is the dedicated hosts, uh, which will give you like one host in which you can put a bunch of different VMs. But then there's also an isolated VM concept where you book the whole host to yourself and you just put one VM in there. There may be extra space on the host, but then that's not how you want it. You just want one virtual machine, which is isolated. So you still have to buy that whole host. And by, by buying it, I mean, you know, when you create that kind of a virtual machine, you pay for it. Uh, you pay for the host. So that's kind of where we can have more security controls. Um, capacity reservations is where now say <clears throat> you're building a virtual machine for a very sensitive, critical application. And we know that sometimes things may, you know, um, things may go down like with Azure, it, it may, there may be uh, failures, there may be outages. And you want to ensure that, that you are able to build that particular virtual machine in that particular region of a particular SKU or size. So you just want to reserve that capacity for your workload. Um, so that's where you would go for capacity reservation. Um, you actually pay for it upfront. So like you pay for that capacity right at the beginning and then whether or not you use it, you're still paying for it. But then you have, um, you know, you're relaxed because now you know, even if uh, things were to break, you still have, not, not breaking actually, but even if there was less capacity available um, or a data center wasn't available, you can still um, create that uh, capacity Azure will, you know, do things for you in the back end where your capacity is reserved. So that's where that comes into picture. And if I, yeah, I'm just saying no for now because I don't have a reservation group. Uh, you'll probably create a reservation group first and then within that you'll do your capacity reservations. Um, then there's a proximity placement group. Um, that's ma mainly for, you know, allowing you to group your Azure resources together. Um, so like, you know, different resources that you're working for using for a particular workload if you want all of them to be placed um, in close proximity um, then you'll kind of create groups so this is there's a lot to you know uh, creating a virtual machine because uh, you have to think through all the different aspects of it so that's where these things come into play and the last part here we create virtual machine is tagging. Um, you may have used tagging in or tags in other uh, things, Azure, but tags basically are like a name value pair where, you know, it, it helps with separating business lines. Um, say your IT department has a particular budget, your um, business side of the house has a particular budget. You want to keep your resources to be tagged to IT so that, you know, you're built for it separately um, or not separate. The billing is basically by subscription, but you can identify your resources with the tags. So if you keep tagging your resources as say IT, um, and this is kind of a very high level example, but if you keep tagging your resources uh, with a particular name, um, then name and value, then um, it helps with you know identifying what resources costed what. So that's kind of gives you the granular um, look or view into your resources and the um, uh, costing. So that's where tags come into play. All right, so with that, I'm gonna move ahead. And I think we are doing great on time as well. Um, we should be mostly done here with the demo. So here, um, towards the end, what it's going to do is you, you really want to see this highlighted here because unless your validation is passed, you won't be able to actually create the virtual machine. Like it won't deploy it. So um, you, you are on the review and create screen where it will show you the price and it will show you um, all the different configurations that you chose along the way. Um, you just take a look, see if it's all good. If not, you can obviously go back and then you say create. And this is how it shows uh, 0.12 USD per hour, pretty cheap. So I'm gonna say create. And it actually takes a little while for the deployment to happen. So it will show you here that the deployment is in progress. Um, while that happens, it will show you what resources it already created, which ones are yet to be created. 
if you keep refreshing here. So it kind of created virtual machine, um, the network interface, um, the virtual network. So all of these different things that we looked at are all separate resources, separate aspects. And this, although this is your main virtual machine, without these, this won't run. So it all comes together when it comes to um, actually using that virtual machine. Now, while that is happening, I do want to show you some other resources here where, um, and I'll put these things in chat um, once we are done with the demo, but this is where um, it, it, Microsoft tells you the various machine series, you know, A series, BS series, and it gives you details on that. So this is a good resource to have for reference, um, also gives you the pricing, you know, just to give you a good estimate around things. And then there's a VM selector. So like, if you're not sure what series VM you should pick, this tool helps you or guides you through the process. Like it asks you, what workload do you have, you know, um, or, or by different categories. So you actually start um, and then it asks you whether, um, say general purpose, general purpose workload, because you would know what kind of workload you have, whether you need a GPU enable, like a graphics workload or memory intensive, CPU intensive. So you say next here, and then it guides you. It says, you know, how many CPUs should the VM have? How much memory should it have? So it lets you build your own. Um, so it's like make to order. So I think this tool comes in handy um, in such situations. Let me go back to here. Um, yep, our deployment is complete. And from here, um, it will show you some of the details and then you can go to the resource, which is your virtual machine. I'm going to go there. And this is your virtual machine. So this is all the details of this machine. It, it's going to show you that public IP address that it created and the size that we selected and all of those things. But for a minute, if we go back and we go to resources, it shows our resource. And within the resource, it's going to show us everything that it just created for us with the virtual machine. So that's how, if you really need to delete your VM, um, then you might want to identify what other things um, you're supposed to delete with it. So you can actually come here and delete the entire resource group. Again, assuming that you only put your VM and its resources in here because there may be other things that, you know, your um, other admins may put in that resource group. So you have to be aware, uh, be aware of that. Uh, but that's that. So uh, let me go back to the VM real quick once again. So here, it shows that your status of your VM is running. But like I said, if you really want to stop it and not having to pay for the compute, then you want to stop it from here. This, when you do stop, that's when it shows you stopped deallocated. But if I were to actually log into this machine and then have Windows shut down on it, then it won't show stop deallocated here. It'll just say stopped, which, is, which means that you're still paying for the compute. Um, let me refresh here real quick. It takes a while to stop the VM as well. So it might not show us deallocated just yet. Yeah, but it says deallocating, so it's doing it. Um, and eventually it'll get there. But that's what you want to see if you really want to stop your VMs and not pay for the compute. Yep, so that's what it does. And then I'm also going to quickly go and delete that whole resource group, just to show you um, how that works. When you want to delete a resource group, um, when you delete a resource group, it is going to delete everything that's in there. It's not really going to ask you to select or whatnot. Um, but one thing it's, it is going to do for you is when you say delete, it's going to ask you to put in the name of the resource group. 
so that you're sure or so that you know you can validate or azure can validate for you that you know what you're doing you're putting in the name and that's what you really want to delete so that's what you can do put in the same name here that we gave to the resource group and then it will delete off everything so yeah that's kind of it and then a couple other things real quick um, there's a pricing calculator available uh, which will help you price out your um, stuff in azure as you move your workloads but you can also price out your virtual machines so that comes in handy as well and then lastly this is a very nice visual i really like it so i wanted to show it here this is the azure global infrastructure experience where it's actually a nice globe where it shows you all the different um, regions or you know not just regions but if you look at the legend um, it shows you all the different geographies regions edge zones you know everything that is built as part of the physical infrastructure and you can act actually click on it move it that's really nice um, you can have a map view as against a globe view i like the globe view um, so yeah you see the satellites moving around here but this is a nice one so if you really want to see what new regions came up or you know what new data centers Microsoft has, you can always go in here and this will be a good, nice, um, fancy tool to check from. Yeah, with that, I think, um, let me go back to my last couple slides here. Um, <clears throat> all right. So yeah, with that, I think uh, these are typically the resources, uh, pretty much the resources that I was showing um, on the web pages. And then basically, where do you go from here, right? Now that you know, I hope you learned um, things about you know VMs today. So now that you know some of that, you definitely want to explore further. You want to explore IaaS, you want to see what's new because obviously it's an ever evolving technology. So there's always new things coming out. And then most of the topics that we discussed, they are part of the AZ-104, which is the Azure Administrator course or the learning path. Uh, it also has a certification. So you might want to go explore that as well. Um, then there's a, I'll put that link in chat as well for the certification exam, but yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, yeah, thank you. Thanks for watching. And I really hope that, um, you know, this was helpful and I definitely enjoyed it. So I hope you did too, but any questions? Not for me, but uh, I'd like to open up the floor. If you have any questions, feel free to come off mute or enter into chat. I thought it was very well done and very thorough. Uh, I certainly learned uh, several key points that I made note of uh, and will be posting them on my blog, uh, but I wanted to thank you for that. I know that you have the global infrastructure uh, map that's, you have a link for that in your PowerPoint. Uh, what about yep. the um, Azure VM uh, capacity planning calculator? Yep, I'll put that as well. I have all, all of that. Very good. And can you send me a link to your PowerPoint or the PowerPoint itself? And I yes, can post that I, on my blog? I will, so, for sure. Excellent, appreciate it, Sushita. Um, yep. So once again, any questions or comments? If I could, real quick, I just wanted to say thank you for this evening, Sushita. Very much appreciated. Yeah. I'm just now getting into the cloud aspect of things myself. Uh, everybody keeps telling me to study AWS and everything, and I'm starting yeah. AWS, but I'm finding very few people that are starting where I am. And I saw this group, and I'm like, hey, I'll just go see what it's about. And it's kind of awesome and even more exciting to see the similarities between Azure and AWS. So yes, that yeah. really settles down a lot of my nerves. So if, um, if you have any idea or any um, advice for somebody starts starting off, I'd really appreciate it. I would say because like most of the industries out there, they leverage Windows as the OS, right? They, all of the employees have Windows laptops. So Azure really comes into play more from that standpoint. Uh, but again, I know there are industries where AWS is used as the cloud platform. Um, but to me personally, I feel uh, more um, confident and more comfortable in Azure because that really closely aligns or is native to Microsoft, you know, as Windows is. So the two really combine together well. 
and uh, that helps me you know keep up with um, the technology easily because i'm using it in my day to day job um, as you know outside of doing such kind of um, uh, events or sessions so yeah i mean i would say if you want to start in the cloud definitely the azure fundamentals which is the ez 900 exam um, if you study for that, it really gives you a good overview of all the concepts. And like 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 you said, you know, Azure and AWS, they are pretty much similar in the things they do. Just the naming uh, conventions are different. But yeah, I feel um, starting with AZ900 and then the next step is the one that I was showing on the slide, which is the Azure administrator. Um, you know, even if you don't want to do the certification exam, you can at least go through the study path for those um, exams, which will definitely give you good insights into um, the cloud. And that's how I started. Like, I did not start with hands-on Azure in, in, in my work, um, because when I started learning Azure, I, I really started with Microsoft documentation, uh, because at that time in the company that I was working at, I had no exposure to Azure, or maybe they didn't even have cloud at that point. So yeah, I, I would say even if you don't have hands-on experience, you can still learn a lot from just the you know documentation. Sorry, documentation and stuff. Yeah. I'd also like to add on that. I completely agree with what you're saying, Sushita. But uh, in addition, one of the things that I love about Microsoft platforms as a whole is that all Microsoft products play very well with any other Microsoft products. They integrate yeah. very well, and it's almost seamless. And in addition to that, you have a large community built around all their products, whether it's Azure or Visual Studio or any of their other products, SQL Server, for example. There's always a large community around it where you can go out to Stack Overflow or find meetups uh, or someone else within the uh, development community that can answer these questions for you. Um, and even though you're, you're starting out, I still, again, I echo Sushita's sentiments about the certification even though your employer may not uh, recognize your certification by a raise or even taking you out to lunch, I think it's very important to still pursue certification because as you're going through that process, you're learning a lot about the, the product itself. Yes. So um, I, I echo those sentiments as well. Exactly, yep. All right, I'll be, very good. I'm gonna be watching for this. Uh, you say you meet up every second Wednesday of the month, Sam, as we said earlier. Yes, sir. So once you signed up for it through Meetup, you'll be getting the subsequent invites, uh, and we meet monthly. Uh, there are already topics already lined up for next month. Awesome. Uh, I think next month is going to be on uh, Azure Open AI, and hmm. uh, we just continue rolling with various topics regarding all three aspects of Azure. Mm -hmm. So uh, you should be getting email invites from Meetup on that. Uh, once a meeting is posted, uh, I click the Announce button, and then an email blast is sent out to all the users. Very cool. And like I said, I really appreciate you guys letting me sit through this. It's really interesting and very, very informative. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. I'm curious, where are you joining us from, Andrew? Uh, I've, I've lived all over, but I'm currently residing in Maslin. Okay, gotcha. So my day job is IT for Timken Steel, and uh, at night and weekends, I'm a concert photographer, so. Oh, interesting, okay. Very good. Well, glad to have met you virtually, and uh, glad you joined us, and uh, looking forward to, uh, to seeing you at uh, future meetings. Uh, the link to the YouTube channel is posted in the chat window. Uh, so this meeting is being recorded and will be posted on YouTube. Uh, I just ask for a couple short days to do the editing, and uh, you'll be getting upload notifications if you subscribe to the channel. Also, tech events will be posted on my blog, and you can subscribe to that as well and get updates. And last but not least, there's an e a link to the uh, feedback eval form in the chat window. If you would please take a moment to fill that out so we can provide Sushita with some constructive criticism. <laughs> if you joined us after the start of the meeting, we have a special offer from Manning.com, 35% off a selection of books. So my contact information, snasser at nistechnologies.com. You can also find me on Twitter at Sam Nasser and the link to my blog once again. Lastly, if we're not connected on LinkedIn, I invite you to do so. And so with that, thanks again to, to Sushita for a very informative presentation, and thank you all for attending, and uh, look forward to seeing you all next month.